All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll give everyone just another minute or so to join the webinar. We have about 17 attendees so far, great, awesome. All right, I will go ahead and get started just by introducing myself. My name is Cameron Kinker. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator with Prevention Access Campaign. Um, just to introduce a little bit about Prevention Access Campaign, we are a health equity initiative working to end the dual epidemics of HIV and HIV-related stigma by empowering people with and vulnerable to HIV with accurate and meaningful information about their social, sexual, and reproductive health. Uh, prevention access campaigns undetectable equals untransmittable or u equals u is a growing global community of hiv advocates activists researchers and over 780 community partners from nearly 100 countries uniting to clarify and disseminate the revolutionary but largely unknown fact that people living with hiv on effective treatment do not sexually transmit hiv U equals U was launched um, in early 2016 by a group of people who were living with HIV who created a groundbreaking consensus statement with global experts to clear up confusion about the science of U equals U. That statement was the genesis of the U equals U movement that is changing the definition of what it means to live with HIV. The movement is sharing the message uh, to dismantle HIV stigma, improve the lives of people living with HIV, and bring us closer to ending the epidemic. Today, we're going to be having a wonderful webinar um, with Nana Khanna, who is the executive director of the Positive Women's Network, as well as Daniel Driffin, uh, who is the co-founder of Thrive SS. Uh, this webinar is kind of a reiteration of their fantastic presentation that they did at the United States Conference on AIDS back in September. Um, it's titled The Third U, uh, Universal Access. So with that, I will kick it over to Nana and Daniel. Great. Thanks so much, Cameron. Welcome, everyone. This is Nana Khanna. I am Executive Director of Positive Women's Network USA um, and joined by Daniel. I'll give Daniel a minute to introduce himself. Daniel, I think you're on mute. Okay, maybe we have some sound issues. Um, so Daniel, just chat me when you're connected back to, to the sound. Um, so Positive Women's Network, for those who don't know, is a national membership body of women living with HIV, inclusive of folks of trans experience. Um, we've been around since 2008, and we are entirely led by um, the constituency that we represent. Our board are entirely women and folks of trans experience living with HIV. Our staff are majority women and folks of trans experience living with HIV and majority people of color. Um, and so what we're going to be talking to you all about today is, um, as Cameron said, you know, kind of how do we advance racial and gender justice in the U equals U response? And so Here's a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be covering. So, um, you know, just a refresher and reminder. I know uh, everyone on this call is very familiar with what U equals U means, but we'll just kind of like go over it briefly. Um, and then we're going to talk about how U equals U has really been a driver of policy and funding priorities. So the science has actually been um, an important driver of priorities. Um, but, you know, kind of thirdly, what, what has this really meant in practice and in life for the communities most impacted by HIV? And particularly when we think about race, gender, sexual um, and a lot of those variations. And then we want to, you know, go into next steps and um, what can we do about this? And so, um, and we also want to hear from you kind of throughout this, um, throughout this webinar. So we'll be trying to watch the chat box. Um, let's see. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, Daniel is back. Um, so we'll be trying to watch the chat box throughout the webinar. Um, we'll be asking you all some questions to respond to, and we'll be wanting to hear your insights and input. I'm going to give Daniel a minute to introduce himself and Thrive SS and anything else he wants to say before we get started. Daniel, are you there?
Hey, Daniel. We're not able to hear you. Okay, um, I'll just keep going and then um, Daniel, just jump in when you get back on the mic. Um, so first of all, just a refresher on what U equals U means. Um, so U equals U means that when people living with HIV, and I'm a person living with HIV myself, um, if we are routinely on treatment, if we're durably undetectable, so undetectable for a period of time, um, we have better health, we um, have less inflammation and all kinds of other things, and hey, um, no transmission of HIV actually happens. And so there's lots of science that backs this up. I'm not really gonna go into the details of the science, but the um, evidence is very strong that when a person living with HIV is undetectable, um, HIV itself is not transmittable, is untransmittable. And so that's what U equals U means. Um, and, uh, and so this is a big deal, right? So study after study has shown that U equals U. Um, so um, starting with the HPTN 052 study, which had sort of like a lot of critique because it was primarily in heterosexual couples and um, the data actually was released before we had a good understanding of all the data. Um, and then through the partner two study, which was a large study in, um, among gay couples where it was actually um, it became much clearer that it um, that we can actually say that zero um, there's zero risk from a person living with HIV who's undetectable um, for a period of time to another um, person through sexual contact and so lots of good data to show that U equals U that undetectable is untransmittable um, and so um, we also know that public health leaders have been using this science, U equals U science, to drive their own policy and their own funding priorities. And so um, this has been a big deal, you know, ever since um, HPTN 052 came out um, several years ago, I think, you know, at the end of that year, we saw a big, um, we saw like covers of magazines, Newsweek and Time, the end of AIDS, is it here? Um, because this is this was revolutionary science and folks are really thinking about it from a public health and an epidemiology perspective that if we can um, if it if it really is true that for people living with hiv having a suppressed viral load means we cannot transmit then that has tremendous implications um, for ending the epidemic or basically bending the curve of the epidemic such that um, any rate of new HIV acquisitions would be lower, um, would continue to go down and down and down, right? So, um, so that we would be getting effectively towards an end. And so um, this, this has been a pretty exciting idea. And, um, and there have been lots of modeling studies, um, you know, kind of predicated on this idea that undetectable is untransmittable. And so we know that scientists and policymakers have believed this for a very long time from a public health perspective. Um, in fact, they believed it so much that they even based the entire most recent version of the National HIV AIDS strategy on it, right? So um, this is the National HIV AIDS strategy updated to 2020. It came out in 2015. Um, the first strategy came out in 2010. Even the first um, National HIV AIDS strategy sort of gave a little bit of a nod to the potential that it might be important to, um, to, um, to increase community level viral suppression as a way to bring down new infections. Um, but in the, in the second version of the National HIV AIDS strategy, it was really clear, right, that the success of, um, of the domestic HIV plan, right, because that's what the National HIV AIDS strategy is, it's a domestic plan to address the epidemic. The success of this plan actually depended very much on treatment as prevention. Um, it depended on um, identifying people living with HIV, making sure that they were, that we are linked to care, um, that the care and treatment is good and high quality and um, culturally relevant. And, um, and from a public health perspective, very importantly, that, um, that we were actually measuring viral suppression and incentivizing um, at a population level, at a clinic level, um, at a, a health systems level, including things like the Ryan White system, incentivizing um, 
those providers that are doing a good job at suppressing viral load because that means that we can end the epidemic. So all of this stuff was happening at the policy level um, and the science level. And it was, it's kind of been just generally well understood that, um, that um, undetectable is untransmittable in the science and policy realm. However, um, that hasn't really necessarily been consistently true for people living with HIV um, in terms of information we've been given. So um, that's kind of what we want to talk a little bit about today is what has this science actually meant for people living with HIV? And um, there is no such thing as sort of as a generic person living with HIV, right? Like we are all different. People have different life experiences. Um, different race and ethnic backgrounds, uh, different um, socioeconomic status. Um, in the United States context, we are particularly concerned because of the demographics of the epidemic with what does U equals U science actually mean for black and brown folks living with HIV? What does U equals U science actually mean for women and folks of trans experience living with HIV? What does U equals U science actually mean in the daily lives of black and brown gay and bisexual men living with HIV um, and low income folks who historically have not had good access to health care? So like, how does this actually translate into our quality of life? Um, and so, sorry, I'm seeing that on the chat box. Okay. So, um, cool. So what does this mean? Well, it, it can mean a lot to us. Um, it's a, a deliberating message. Um, you know, here's a, a little quote from UNAIDS that says, this knowledge can be empowering for people living with HIV. Um, this awareness that we're no longer, um, and I would say capable of, transmitting HIV sexually can provide people living with HIV with a stronger sense of being agents of prevention in our approach to newer existing relationships. Um, this is a, a document created by UNAIDS, but I know from my personal life and from my conversations with folks living with HIV that this, um, this message is deeply transformative. It, um, it helps us um, reduce internalized stigma about ourselves. It can help to um, free us from shame and this feeling that we're, our bodies are toxic or dangerous to people we love. Um, it can be incredibly liberating um, for uh, people who are thinking about conceiving or, um, or getting someone else pregnant. This information can be um, also incredibly, it can open up a whole new world of reproductive possibility as well. And so, um, so this message actually is a very beautiful message and, uh, and has a lot of hope and a lot of potential. Um, but sadly, we haven't always seen this, you know, the U equals U message kind of be equally accessible or equitably accessible to um, different communities for a range of reasons. And we'd love to hear a bit about, um, about um, some of you know, what that has been for you. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, so in, even, even, though, even though the US National HIV AIDS strategy was based on, um, on U equals U science, on treatment as prevention science, um, even though there's been all of this momentum at the national and federal level by federal agencies, we still had many federal agencies who were um, not really saying this openly. Like, so this, this is something I wrote about actually for the last World AIDS Day, you know, basically we were being the bodies of people living with HIV were being mathematically modeled as benign, but we were simultaneously being told still that we were risky and radioactive and dangerous by the federal agencies that were supposed to be um, responsible for public health. And so the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention didn't openly say that um, people with HIV who are undetectable cannot transmit HIV until about a year ago, October of 2017, if you look at the date on this, um, this news release here. And so this is sort of like a, a schism in the way public health was happening and the way, um, and the sort of contrasting way that human rights for people living with HIV has been advancing. And um, why is that? I would argue, and I think Daniel would as well, that 
This is very much because of who's most impacted by HIV in the United States um, it, and, and globally. And so um, this is very much a consequence of homophobia and racism and transphobia and um, a historical um, long-standing need to control uh, the bodies and reproduction sexuality of women. Um, and so these, you know, these things are all kind of linked together. Um, let me just see if Daniel is back. Um, okay. So then the question becomes, so, you know, how and to what extent are black and brown gay and bisexual men, women, and folks of trans experience benefiting from the science? Um, and, and so PWN has found that um, we've, been, we've been kind of looking at this ever since the 052 data came out. And we found, um, we've kind of like continually found that women living with HIV are not benefiting as much as we could be. So back in um, 2013, we actually did a national survey um, and a, a whole sort of like study and assessment of what we called um, sexuality, romance, and reproductive freedom for women living with HIV in the United States. And this um, report was authored entirely by women living with HIV. Um, it incorporated um, a research um, literature, an assessment of research literature. It also in, uh, incorporated an assessment of uh, a survey, results from a survey that we did of uh, nearly 200 women living with HIV. Um, as well as some other things. And what we found was um, that over half of our respondents had not been counseled yet on viral suppression as an HIV prevention strategy. And these were women living with HIV who were engaged in regular healthcare, had good relationships with their medical providers, um, and were, were pretty active. So these were, these were about 200 women that we were able to reach relatively quickly, and we reached them through um, their care providers. And um, so the, this was about two years after the HBTN 052 data had first come out, that about half of women living with HIV who are pretty highly engaged in care um, and following, you know, kind of advocacy trends and things like that in general had not been told by their providers um, that, uh, that viral suppression was an effective prevention strategy. Um, so what has kind of shifted since then we repeated the we repeated the survey we actually did a different survey about two years later but that's one of the the same questions we asked and we found that it was still over 40 percent of women living with hiv who are regularly in healthcare um, as of 2015 had still not been told by their providers that viral suppression was an effective hiv prevention strategy um, and so we find this to be a tremendously huge violation of sexual and reproductive rights of um, all people living with HIV and people impacted by HIV. Um, so, you know, there's also been, this has been sort of like understood and articulated also um, by thebody.com who, um, you know, kind of looked at how women with HIV are often still shamed, um, even if they can't transmit, are being shamed by their providers. I know as a woman living with HIV myself for, um, for many years, the doctors that I would talk to would only ask if I was using condoms. Um, they never even asked if, um, if, a, if I needed birth control or um, if I was using any other um, methods of, um, of HIV prevention myself. And so uh, even though people in the community have known actually for a pretty long time that um, you know, folks have been testing this, people living with HIV have been kind of testing this idea that if we're undetectable, we can't transmit for longer than um, scientists have been putting us in kind of like longitudinal studies to, um, to model it. Um, so, um, so I'm curious to hear from folks, maybe in the chat box, um, how do folks think race, gender, and sexuality affect access to information about U equals U? And folks can respond in the chat room if they want to.
Okay, I'll keep going. Um, sorry. Okay, I see some responses coming in. The stigma is still so thick. People of color are probably less likely to be told about U equals U. Um, someone saying that it takes fear out of sex. Yes. Yep. Yeah, these are all great responses. Anything else? Folks from disenfranchised communities are less likely to engage in systems that should be communicating this message. Um, okay. Someone's saying, yeah, I've had multiple women of color tell me they're still being told not to trust this message. This is happening at a specific hospital that serves a low income population. Many people I talk with don't believe you equals you. Lack of culturally competent messages. Yes. Uh huh. So you equals you has the opportunity to be a tremendous tool to really end and address stigma. Um, but we continually hear, we hear from providers, we hear from public health officials that um, they're, sometimes they're uncomfortable giving this information to folks and that discomfort is frequently grounded in um, this idea that people living with HIV can't be trusted with this information, right? And at its core, that belief um, and that narrative is a racist, homophobic, uh, patriarchal, misogynistic narrative. Um, so I'm seeing some, yeah, a provider once responded that we don't know who y'all are having sex with. Um, some health professionals don't know about it or may not be as comfortable with the information. Providers are selective in who they tell. Um, and then I'm also seeing that um, somebody also commented that there's a, in, in one state, in Connecticut, um, there is a resistance among major stakeholders leaning towards PrEP and instead of these getting to, um, instead of U equals U in the getting to zero conversations. U equals U has been a hard sell. Quote, consumers don't understand what undetectable means. Um, yeah, these are really, um, these are really very um, problematic narratives about um, that, you know, that deny people agency um, and that kind of refuse to acknowledge that people living with HIV have um, historically been and continue to be really well informed actually about what's going on with our health. Um, and these are like at their core, these are like racist, um, really racist class narratives about um, medical information, which should be our human right, scientific information that should be our human right. Um, okay, great. So things from, um, you know, different, different kinds of, uh, of experiences from providers not having the accurate information or not being comfortable with the science um, to uh, providers having assumptions and um, public health officials having assumptions. So thank you. Um, so I'll keep going. So we see that these, these kinds of dynamics actually play out in all kinds of healthcare settings. This is not unique to HIV. Um, HIV just happens to be a very, you know, egregious example. Uh, many people in the sort of general public are very uncomfortable with the idea that um, people living with HIV have sex at all, right? <laughs> Let alone that we actually could be having sex um, without condoms and, and for pleasure and um, not just for procreation and, uh, and also that, um, that we have the right to enjoy our sex lives and to feel liberated and free around our sex. And um, so this, um, this photo up here is of Serena Williams who um, you may have heard went through a really terrible experience with her own uh, childbirth and aftercare as a mother. And we see this dynamic come up repeatedly with black mothers um, who have much, you know, worse rates of maternal mortality, um, worse outcomes from um, childbirth and procedures that should be really sort of like routine and helpful. And much of it is about um, providers, healthcare providers, sometimes having racist assumptions about what black women are telling them. Um, so 
these dynamics that are playing out in terms of access to information about U equals U science are not that different if, if you really boil down to it. Um, you know, Serena Williams said, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling these things. This doesn't feel right. Something is going on. And her, um, her doctors at first didn't really trust her to be telling the truth. And so they didn't kind of address it immediately. And she had, um, she had some complications after childbirth due to that. Um, but also we know that if we look at the PrEP data, and there's been a lot more kind of investment in, um, if you look at the literature, there's a lot more data around attitudes about PrEP than there is about attitudes on um, U equals U or treatment of prevention science. And there's a reason for that. You know, there's lots of um, sort of money um, that goes towards um, focused conversation. So there are there's a lot of motivation there um, but it also but in, in addition to the money I think it kind of reflects um, who we're really concerned about as a society and so um, but the, the same, same dynamics are kind of showing up so in this study of um, that was looking at the impact of patient race on clinical decisions related to prescribing PrEP uh, you can see that the black patient was rated as more likely than the white patient uh, to engage in increased unprotected sex if prescribed PrEP, which in turn was associated with reduced willingness to prescribe PrEP to the patient. So um, these kinds of um, assumptions, again, and dynamics are similar assumptions and dynamics that um, I, I would contend are driving the way uh, patients are likely to be told about um, U equals U science. Um, similarly, in, um, in prescriptions for, um, for PCP therapy, like basically for uh, PCP prophylaxis, which prevents um, pneumocystis screening pneumonia for people living with HIV. Um, this is a much older study, but you can see that these, these um, racial disparities in prescriptions have been going on for a long time. So even though in this one study from 19, 1994, uh, looking at racial disparities in <coughs> in antiretroviral therapy, um, there were no racial differences in the stage of HIV disease, but only 48% of eligible Black folks, compared with 63% of eligible White folks, received the ART. Um, also, PCP prophylaxis was received by 82% of eligible white folks in that study, but only 58% of eligible black people in that study. So that was of people living with HIV, right? So these dynamics have been going on for a very long time. Um, and again, you know, looking again at the PrEP data, um, we see repeatedly that racism and heterosexism are playing out. So this was a study of medical students um, and clinical decision making related to um, what what these medical students thought about patient risk. So um, when the patient said they were using condoms, they plan to sustain their condom use, many of the medical students expressed a willingness to pre prescribe PrEP. Uh, but they also had judgments about what the patients should and shouldn't be doing. Um, only 86% were willing to prescribe if the patient had multiple partners compared with 93% if the patient had one partner. Um, even less were willing to prescribe if the patient didn't use condoms and didn't plan to use condoms um, or were using condoms but planned to discontinue using them, right? And um, more participants accepted a patient discontinuing condoms for conception, 69%, than for intimacy, pleasure, or sexual functioning. Um, and you see by the time we get to pleasure and sexual functioning, we're just above basically 10% of medical students who are willing to prescribe PrEP. So this, this is PrEP data, and this is certainly, um, you know, problematic and stands on its own. Also, I think that this is very relevant to um, the U equals U conversation, because I, I suspect that the same types of dynamics are playing out in what information is shared, um, why, and how. And so we have in here, you know, I think in this, in this paragraph, you can see a whole lot of stuff going on about sexual stigma, um, judgment, moral judgments about what people should and should not be doing with their bodies. Um, this idea that 
um, that, you know, conception or procreation is acceptable, but pleasure is not, sexual functioning is not um, an acceptable reason to um, choose PrEP over condom use. Um, and these are related to, you know, just sort of like dominant social narratives about how people should and shouldn't be having sex and why people should and shouldn't be having sex. And of course, um, are very much, you know, kind of like homophobic um, narratives as well and racist narratives. So, um, so in summary, I think we're seeing that racism, homophobia, transphobia, sexual stigma, reproductive stigma and general ideas about what people should and shouldn't be doing with our bodies are all shaping access to this information. Um, however, we know that um, information about U equals U is a human right for people living with HIV. And so um, I'm just checking again to see if Daniel has been able to join us. No, okay, I'll keep going. Um, so, um, just to tell you a little bit about some of what, um, some of the work that's been happening in the arena of racial and gender justice, um, you may have heard that HIV Racial Justice Now um, is a coalition of people of color, leaders in the HIV movement who have come together to basically um, articulate and um, and start to work on advancing a racial justice lens for our movement. So uh, this is uh, this is uh, some pictures from our founding meeting, which was last spring in 2017. Um, from that meeting, we wrote a declaration of liberation um, for a racially just and strategic domestic HIV movement. I invite you to check it out on the website, but I'm just, um, I'm actually just covering this because I wanted to present to you a um, definition. What do we mean when we say racial justice? Well, what we came up with in our um, conversations and in the course of writing this document is a definition of racial justice as the collective practice of people of color and allies to identify, dismantle, and heal from the many external and internal harms of structural and institutional racism. And this practice invites us to collaborate across communities of color in the service of dismantling white supremacy and building power. Um, and so to think about how a racial justice lens can be applied to the dissemination of um, this U equals U information, which um, the information is a fundamental human right. What does this mean? And um, this is one of the things I hope we can talk about when we get to the discussion. Um, it's like, what does this mean? What does it mean for um, providers who are um, people of color? What does it mean for the way we shape our service delivery response? Like who should be um, providing which, which kinds of services, who should really be constructing our um, narratives, what does cultural relevance actually mean. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is part of what we also say in the Declaration of Liberation, uh, that healthcare, including comprehensive sexual and reproductive care, is a human right. And um, that is, U equals U information is a piece of um, comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care. Um, this is the group of folks who are part of that founding convening of HIV racial justice now. And then gender justice, um, just to throw another definition in here, um, Positive Women's Network defines gender justice as an aspirational vision where people of all genders are equally valued, where gender does not influence vulnerability to violence, oppression, access, or marginalization in any form. Um, and further, we define a gender justice analysis as one which accounts for oppression and inequitable access based on gender in creating and proposing solutions. Um, I think it's important to point out that we see gender justice um, and gender injustice as structures that don't only impact people of one or several genders, but people of all genders. And so um, we would look at, you know, U equals U science, um, access to information about viral suppression as a prevention strategy for um, people living with HIV as having lots of different components that are gendered, including questions like, um, 
like what does this mean for folks of trans experience who may be, um, you know, where people of trans experience often uh, suffer from really terrible and low quality um, sexual and reproductive health care. So how do we successfully integrate um, a non-stigmatizing and culturally relevant understanding of U equals U science into sexual and reproductive health care settings that are, that are serving people of trans experience well, especially people of trans experience living with HIV. Um, so these, uh, these are just some questions for us to consider. And from an intersectionality perspective, um, in the, you know, in the conversation around um, gender justice and HIV prevention, we believe that a successful response considers where and how HIV enters people's lives. So is it at the intersection, it's, it is at the intersection of poverty, of gender-based violence, sexual and reproductive health, um, power dynamics in relationships, and denial of bodily autonomy for women and people of trans experience, as well as a fragmented healthcare system. Um, and so with that, I want to move into um, discussion and Q&A. Oh, it looks like we have Daniel back. Um, so Daniel, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this next section over to you if you wanna add anything before we move into our discussion and Q&A. I believe he's still having some audio issues. Okay, got it. So um, I think if folks have any um, questions or comments, you can either put them in the box or is there a way for folks to unmute themselves also? Or no, or to raise their hands? Yeah, if anyone is interested in, in speaking, you can write in the chat box to allow you to talk and I can, uh, as the host, uh, allow people to speak. Cool, so it'd be great to hear from folks. Um, what what ideas do people have to really advance access to U equals U information for communities of color, um, for black gay and bisexual men, for um, trans women of color, um, and other people who probably are not getting this information because of, um, because of bias and prejudice that, um, and it, that is ranging from interpersonal bias and prejudice to structural bias and prejudice and racism. Um, may I? Okay, so I hear, um, I see a message here. And just a reminder that if you put your thing on all pan panelists and attendees, everybody will be able to see your comments. Um, here's a comment from Alexander Garbara that in talking about poverty, it seems like there needs to be discussion about how policies and procedures perpetuate cycles of poverty. Absolutely, that's a great, um, a great point. And love to hear about any particular ideas to do that. Um, Andrea, I see a suggestion here about utilizing recreation centers to provide information. Mm -hmm. Great, Brian, I see um, a question from you. Is it okay, can we just unmute you to ask this maybe or to raise the question? It's kind of long to read. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to copy and paste it if that's okay so that everybody can see it because you just sent it to the panelists. So here's a question from Brian. Um, what aspects of the HIV research agenda we as a community uh, are and should be monitoring to extend this conversation beyond U equals U? What's next for us in the biomedical realm? 
that could be equally or more transformative for trans people, people of color, women? How do we hold research and providers accountable so the next research advancement reaches us? These are great questions. Cool. Advocating for you equals you to be addressed in more research studies. Um, okay, Daniel, I think Daniel's not able to unmute himself, but he's saying that we have to be on IRBs, we have to okay the research in addition to translating the science when it's finished, once it's finished. And I have unmuted a number of people. So Marcelo, Alexander, Andrea, Brian, and Kimberly, I've all allowed you to, to speak if you are uh, want to elaborate on your questions at all. Great, that would be helpful. Thanks. Um, you know, this is Marcelo from Um I I'm very happy to see the promotion of PrEP around online, on subways, and everywhere. I wish that they would do the same thing for you equals you. Um, one thing is that you need to meditate a million people to end the epidemic, a million people who are negative on PrEP to end the epidemic, opposite to 600,000 who are still um, not undetectable, but can be much easily treated and found and tested. So, you know, it's just a question of numbers, you know, 600,000 versus a million people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's, a, um, that's such a great point. I mean, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of people who could benefit personally, directly from having access to quality care and treatment, including um, being able to maintain an, undetectable, maintain an undetectable viral load, right? Yet all of this energy um, and resources are going towards um, folks who um, don't have HIV in many cases. So why do, you, why do you think that is, or do you have any thoughts about how to address that? It looks like a bunch of people are unmuted, so feel free to jump in with your comments or questions. I think the financial interest. I'm sorry. This is Andrea in Philadelphia. Um, the reason why I had mentioned uh, places like the recreational recreational centers and different venues in that state, and especially within the city of Philadelphia, is that a lot of our LGBTQ, you know, trans, they do frequent some of the rec centers. And one of, the, uh, one of the things in speaking with uh, some of the rec centers, they're wanting to see how they, be, they can become more diverse in serving all of their communities as what rec centers are supposed to do. So I feel as though if we give them a, a, a space that's, that's, you know, that's safe and that's comfortable for them, you know, we can uh, as disseminate the information of U equals U and give them the information needed to help, you know, uh, with the you you equals you equals you and other um, and other materials, rather as regards to housing and different things of that nature, some place where they can come, you know, and gather and not feel isolated, and that they have to stay at certain centers to be, you know, heard or in or you know to be accepted, but to uh, to you know now invite them like within the communities, and I hate to say dumb like that is dumb in us, but you know to have to have them in their communities where they live and where they eat, sleep, and a lot work um, to just, you know, feel a part of the community. And, you know, it's one step at a time, but community centers, I find, that are now wanting to do that, um, in this, especially in our city of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Really moving beyond sort of like clinical settings and traditional settings to understand that we're talking about community health, community wellness. 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, is someone else about to say something? Um, here's a question from Daniel. Um, rural communities as a medical case manager, um, or a question from, from the room via Daniel. <laughs> I work in rural communities as a medical case manager. How can I get primary care providers in those areas um, to increase using the U equals U message when they're not talking about healthy sex with my clients in the first place, right? Due to stigma and being conservative Bible Belt communities. So that's really, that's really a lot of the question is like, um, U equals U, um, tre treatment as prevention science basically means talking about sex, um, which at, you know, fundamentally is something that a lot of folks are uncomfortable with. And so what have, um, what have people found works in some more conservative communities around having these conversations? Uh, may I say something? Please. Yeah, this is Marcel again. I think that there is also, we have to look also at financial interests, you know. There is a huge financial interest to Medicaid people. Um, drug companies are all over the place and insurance companies all over the place too. But uh, when you mention U equals U, it's kind of, I think there's a lack of that financial interest. It's not so evident. I mean, we still have to make people undetectable. They need to be medicated for that, but it's not so clear. As uh, for PrEP, for instance, uh, I think $1,600 a month if you're not, ins not insured. Um, and I think that that makes a difference too. So I think we should look into that. Yes, great point. Thank you. Nana, could you repeat the question one more time? I apologize. Oh, it, it, um, actually, we're just hearing folks' comments and reflections on um, what, um, you know, what, what ideas folks have to address this race and gender gap in the U equals U science scene. So, um, you know, Mm -hmm. On my note, I we we just did a client we just did a um conference here in Philadelphia called Connecting the Dots on Friday, and it's so funny that you say that because I spoke about this in the U equals U um conference there, where we have to make the health professionals uncomfortable, um and having uncomfortable conversations, or or comfortable and having uncomfortable conversations about sex. Because one of the things that they're, they're doing a huge injustice is when they're not talking about these issues, you know, pertaining to sex and, you know, um, the conference was actually on mental health and HIV, but just pertaining to sex and, you know, talking um, about ways to keep yourself, you know, healthy and safe and different things like that. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's starting out is starting to be a real big issue. Not that it's starting to be, it's been a very big issue for a very long time with our health professionals not feeling comfortable and having those uncomfortable conversations, which in turn is really doing a huge injustice to their patients that they're serving. Um, so that's, that's something that I would love to try, take and try to uh, see what we could do more of in regards to helping them the health professionals I'm uh, talking about to have those, you know, having those uncomfortable conversations that, you know, that serves to prove to help their, you know, their patients and the community as well. Yeah, we like fun, we have to get more comfortable just talking about sex, right? Yes. Because we're doing it, so we need to be real comfortable with talking <laughs> about it. We can do it. Why can't we talk about it? Exactly, exactly. And you know, and I, I feel as though health professionals uh, do their do their patients a huge injustice when they don't talk about it to them, um, because as we know, not everybody has the privilege of growing and having parents that talk about it. You know, especially within a lot of communities of color where it's quote unquote 
sometimes is a taboo and no one wants to talk about it. So we don't have anyone talking about it and our health professionals are just as stigmatized to talk about it. Then, you know, you have a whole population of people that's just are going on. I guess this is right. <laughs> you know, so we definitely have to have those conversations. And one of the things that I'm trying to uh, work with a group here is to have a, you know, go around and have like lunch and learns again with health professionals in regards to talking about sex and, you know, ways of protecting themselves with their clients, you know, mm -hmm. something simple that they should all know, but, you know, it, it, there's a lot out there that's just not comfortable in doing it. There's one other thing. It's not just sex that people don't talk about. People don't talk about drugs either. Mm -hmm. I've been talking to my HIV doctor, and I feel that uh, healthcare practitioners don't know how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're talking about methamphetamine, which is very popular among gay men now. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually having a forum about it at the end of November. Uh, the hashtag is NYC Pina Forum. 2018. And that's one of the things that we want to talk about. Actually, we plan to start a forum with the video from the AIDS 1220 conference where the doctor says that there is no risk. Uh, starting, you know, just putting it out there that uh, uh, this is not just like hearsay. There's studies and, uh, and science behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, that that's a that's a really great point. There are lots of different stigmas that are intersecting with each other, and um, and in many ways, it would be it would be great if we could just sort of like we have to work on addressing um, you know provider and clinician stigma about a lot of the things that. Um, that are going on for, in folks' lives. And at the same time, there might be structural interventions that we can make too. Like why, why can it be required that, um, you know, that providers are counseling, document that they've counseled their patients and their clients about the U equals U science? Why can it be required that people in the HIV workforce are getting uh, education and information about the latest treatment and prevention science on an annual basis. Like, why why can't those things just be, you know, kind of worked in? Um, why can't it be required that if you see a certain number of people living with HIV, you need to participate in certain kinds of continuing education, and that includes, um, you know, that should include sort of like a, a U equals U. Um, science training so that folks understand the science but understand it also from a reproductive justice perspective and from the perspective of um, of sexual rights and human rights and bodily autonomy um, so Brian asked a question earlier about what you know what might this um, cause us to think about in other kinds of uh, research that are coming down the pipeline. I think that's a very rich question to consider. Um, this, um, this scientific information came out, you know, about, it started to come out about seven or more years ago, but the Swiss statement came out many years before that. Um, scientists have, are, have known for a long time and communities have known for a long time that um, it seemed to be true that if people living with HIV were virally suppressed, we were less likely to transmit. Yet, all these years later, um, we still have providers who are unwilling to say that, and they're unwilling to say that um, fundamentally because they don't think we should have, be having sex or we shouldn't be having certain kinds of sex or um, right. we can't be trusted to really understand this information and use it in ways that are, you know, quote unquote, responsible. Can you all hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so I want to piggyback off the question that was asked. You know, I, in my opinion, oh. if you see that your doctor is not that type of doctor that would like that, that feels uncomfortable for having that type of conversation, you need to find a way to make your doctor comfortable with having that um, information. Webinars like this and others that, you know, come about are helpful webinars, you know. These are the times when you can let your doctor say, look, it's a webinar coming up. I think you should really pay attention to it and get involved. 
And as far as getting the message out, like I've just trust the commercial so much, so, so much to where now, um, again, this is with Don from Michigan, that Detroit is actually doing a contest on getting the message you equals you out. And yes, I have created my little poster with my face on it, but I'm just saying, those are different ways of trying to get the message out there. You know, create a contest for those that do know about it and have the community be the ones to actually participate in this com in this conversation. You know, what does you equals you mean to you? To me, it, it, it gives people a chance to look at HIV in a whole new light. You know, it's giving us freedom. It's giving us privileges. It's, it's so many, it's so much more, but that's just something I think should be done. If you feel that your doctor is taboo about the conversation, you need to bring that, you need to make your, com your doctor have that conversation with you. Me and my doctor talk about everything and he don't have a choice because the type of person I am. So if I need some questions about sex, I'm gonna ask my doctor about their sex questions and it's up to my doctor to answer them. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, that's a, a creative idea. And, and, you know, I just want to say one thing in regards to the comment that was just made on that note. You have to realize not everyone is like us as an advocate. You, you have whole communities that don't even know how to ask a question. So that's why, you know, we have to get out there as advocates and advocate to teach our communities, you know, rather than forums, like I was making a suggestion about, you know, you know our rec centers and all, because our communities our persons in our communities don't even don't know how to advocate for themselves so i when i was mentioning that in regards to our huge injustices to health professionals health professionals are supposed to be there to ask those tough questions mm -hmm. and they're not asking them but they're but we can't put it on the um patients all the time because a lot of the times patients don't understand you know you're if you're telling people that you have to have um, materials in your office at a fifth grade reading level so that when everyone can understand well not right. everyone does understand so the thing is we have to as advocates get out in our communities and educate our communities so when they do go into those doctor's offices they can have some type of knowledge of what's being said but that's been the whole barrier and the challenge is getting the community out and finding ways to get those um, different communities to come and learn about what's going on. The transgender community, they're so stigmatized. It's, it's horrible the way that they get treated even in, in, in public a lot of the times. So they're scared to ask the questions. So we need to have our health professionals asking them those questions and being comfortable in asking those questions, whether it has to do with sex, whether it has to do with drugs or anything. And again, I said our health professionals that are not asking questions are doing huge injustices, justices to our communities, because our communities, you know, they're they're everyone's in layman terms in our communities. You can't, they don't understand. A lot of them don't understand when they go to doctor's office and they're telling you that you're hypoglycerized glycis like or up. You know, they want to hear that. Okay, you got a blood pressure problem, and we need to give you some pills and how to take these pills. These are the ways that we have to, you know, have professionals approach our communities. Um, so I'm just a little biased on that one and I apologize, but I know being an advocate, we speak up for ourselves. We now have to find ways to teach our communities more how to do that as well. And you know what? And I have to apologize on that too, because honestly, in my role, I am like a linkage to care specialist and that is my role to teach other clients how to become advocates for themselves. Even though our program is only for a six month time, we're still in that six month time. I'm trying to make sure that my client understand that this is your life. No one can advocate on your life better than you. So I apologize on that because I, th that is true. You do have to teach them. And that is something that we do here in Detroit. We kind of have this program that we started in Detroit called Link of Detroit. And it's pretty much helping people that's been newly diagnosed or people that's been, di been diagnosed and lost care you know, help them to understand why it's important for them to be in care or even to get back in care. So that's part of my role is to teach people, you know, how to advocate on themselves. And I go to the doctor with them and if they feel like, I ask them, do you understand what the doctor just said? And if they say no, ask the doctor what it is that he's trying to explain it to you. So you're right, that is true. And that's the biggest part right there is teaching the community how to advocate for themselves. Well, they take it with the driver. Yeah.
I do want to be mindful of um, everyone's time. Um, and thank you all so much for all of these amazing questions. It's clear that there's obviously so much more we can continue to talk about. I'll be sending a follow-up email um, with uh, more information as well as the contact info that uh, Daniel and Nana have on the slide now. Um, but from on behalf of Prevention Access Campaign, thank you all so much for attending. And uh, Nana, I don't know if you wanted to say anything as well to, to close out the webinar. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, thanks to Cameron and Prevention Access Campaign for pulling this together. Um, thank you all so much for joining. It's really inspiring to hear, you know, your ideas and how much energy there is around this issue. And um, I, I absolutely think that there are a lot of things we can do better and um, hope that we can continue to talk about that. So for folks who will be at the um, Biomedical Prevention Summit, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, maybe we can continue this conversation more in person. And um, for folks who won't, you know, I think this is also a good um, topic to consider writing blogs about for World AIDS Day and things like that. And um, you could, you know, you can probably submit stuff to the um, U equals U prevention access campaign, um, social media website and things like that. If you're interested, feel free to get in touch with Daniel and myself with any questions. Our contact information is here. And thanks so much to Daniel as well. I know that he's sorry he wasn't able to speak today, but um, Hopefully he was, I know he was able to respond to some folks' questions in the chats and we're both here for you as resources. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoy your holiday weekends. You too. Bye.